Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the efficient geospatial data access with NASA's APPEARS Earth Data webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we are going to go ahead and get started here. What I'll do first is begin today's event with a few logistics. To ensure the best audio experience, all participants have been placed in silent mode. But if you have any uh, questions or you have any issues, please enter those either into the Q&A panel Panel, um, and you'll see that uh, located on the right side of your screen or the chat. If you don't see the Q&A panel, there are three dots at the bottom. I think it's the center or the right. You click on that and it will uh, pull up your panel options and then you can insert a check mark next to um, the Q&A. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to the NASA Earth Data website as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a week of completion. Uh, but usually it takes me just a couple of days. Uh, once completed, I will send an email to all of the registrants with the recording links and also a link to the presentation slide deck used within today's webinar. As far as timing is concerned, today's event will be one hour and 15 minutes long with an hour allocated to the presentation and demonstrations. A 15 minute Q&A period <clears throat> will follow. And well, so basically it's one hour, 15 minutes total. So you've got your initial presentation time, which is roughly 45 minutes, and then we'll have two Q&A um, periods. We'll use an extended Q&A period um, depending upon the volume of questions that we receive, but we will have a hard cutoff of 3.15 uh, Eastern time. Our speaker for today's webinar is Aaron Fries. Aaron is the science coordination lead at NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or, Arch or LPDAC. He will begin today's event, and let me actually pull up the agenda for you. He will begin today's event by providing an introduction to NASA's application for extracting and exploring analysis-ready samples, or APIRS. And then from there, he'll conduct um, a couple of different APIRS demos, beginning with the APIRS application demo, then transitioning to an APIRS API Python demo, which will really showcase um, cloud access. After he has completed his demonstrations, he will showcase some example use cases, focusing on the ability of APIRS to streamline your data workflows. Um, and after this, what we'll do um, is transition to another final optional set of polling questions, and then from there, jump directly into the Q&A session. And just a word about the Q&A session. Today, we will have uh, three LPDAC panelists uh, this afternoon. Dr. Bree Lind, who is a remote sensing ecologist at LPDAC. Eric Bolch, a remote sensing scientist, and Masa, somebody is unmuted here. Let me just, all righty, let me get back to this. And Masa, uh, Jamie, I hope, or Jamie, and uh, also a remote sensing scientist at LPDAC. Uh, we'll try to answer all of the questions within the time allotted, but if we are not able to address your question during each of the segment uh, Q&As, our speaker will follow up with you offline. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this afternoon's webinar event, Aaron Fries. Aaron, and so let me stop sharing my screen, Aaron, and then I'm gonna toss the presenter roll over to you so you can get started. All right, Aaron, you should have presenter roles. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Let's do screen two. All right. Let's get into this. Okay, so thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all for, for attending the webinar today. Um, to reiterate, uh, my name is Aaron Fries. I am the science coordination lead at the LP DAC. Uh, and we're going to be kind of doing a reintroduction to APIRS uh, and highlighting how it can be used to uh, efficiently work or at least access geospatial data um, uh, within NASA and other archives. So the obligatory DAC slide here, uh, LP stands for Land Processes Distributive Active Archive Center. We are one of several DACs uh, spread across the country, each of us supporting or, or archiving uh, remote sensing geospatial data uh, for a specific discipline. Um, our partner, we have a partnership between NASA and USGS uh, at the LP DAC. This has been in place since 1990. 
Uh, and we are uh, part of the NASA Earth Observing System Data and Information System, or EOS DIS. Uh, you may have heard that acronym. Um, we are located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota at the USGS Eros Center. Um, and then also all of our data, NASA data, really across the board is available at no charge, at no cost to our users. Um, and all the resources we, we provide are also uh, open source and available. So getting into APPEARS, uh, APPEARS stands for the Application for Extracting and Exploring Analysis Ready Sample. Really, this is just a, an application or a utility that allows um, kind of streamlined access to NASA Earth observation data. Um, it allows you to discover, mine, and visualize the data discovery in that um, you can request data that uh, intersects with your specific use, um, use case or your uh, research needs. Uh, appears goes out and grabs that data and extracts it for you uh, and gives you the ability to visualize that data all before having to download uh, anything. Um, it provides at archive data reduction. And so this means that you do not have to download any data uh, up front. Um, it does all the subsetting um, and the pre-processing uh, before you have to make the decision to do any sort of download. We provide kind of GIS uh, friendly uh, analysis ready data formats that allow for, for increased uh, interoperability and usability uh, really across multiple platforms and scripting languages. And then we also provide some, some documents and some um, uh, files that allow for traceability. So what, what data was used and what happened to that data in the process, as well as some files that allow for reproducibility that uh, you can either rerun your requests uh, in your, your kind of personal appears, or you can hand that, off, that file off to a, another uh, colleague and they can rerun that exact same job and get the same uh, results that you have. This is not our first time presenting on appears. That's why I, I mentioned reintroduction. Um, back in 2017, we kind of had our coming, our coming out party for, for appears. This was really the, the first time that we had achieved a lot of our major milestones that we had uh, documented. So things like having both capabilities for extracting points and areas. Uh, we had introduced a lot of the, um, the data products that uh, LPDAC supports. And then also um, we included a, a handful of um, uh, partner DAC data sets into to appears too. So really kind of just introducing people to appears at that time. Uh, since then, we've made a number of improvements uh, and uh, appears really has has really come a long way, both in terms of uh, its capabilities and um, in its uh, popularity. Uh, we since 2017, we've added or made available the appears API. This isn't really new news. This is relatively old. We did, I think, a webinar that kind of highlighted it, um, but it is available and it was it wasn't uh, back in 2017. Um, we've added about 80 data sets, and this is maybe a little misleading. Compared to 2017, we were about 80 plus data sets, but um, due to kind of different product life cycles, versioning, deprecation of data products, um, we're about 80 above, but we have in fact added a lot more uh, than that number uh, there. Um, we've moved Earth or, uh, appears to Earth Data Cloud. Now, this was a huge effort and it has a lot um, going for it. Uh, it's paid off in a lot of ways. Um, the operations part, uh, the, the, the performance of appears has become better. Um, and also from a user standpoint, um, you can still not only download the data uh, as you have always, but you can now uh, do a complete cloud workflow if you want to accessing that, the, the data um, that's returned by appears in S3 now. Finally, um, since 2017, we've, we've not only kind of gained a, a, a very loyal uh, lo um, user base, um, but I mean, they've, they've used it more and more um, in their workflows. And so this really kind of plays out in our metrics that we, we keep track of. Um, a six month average back in 2017, we had about 744 requests coming in per month. Uh, now that sets at about 47,000 over 47. In fact, this is kind of a conservative number um, we've often touched, or in the last three months, we've gone above 50,000, and actually a couple months ago, we've touched 80,000. So 
um, a very uh, useful, not only useful, but um, powerful tool. So the title of this, this presentation was Efficient Geospatial Data Access. And there's kind of a couple different ways I, I come at this, um, this title anyway. There's one from a, a user standpoint where understanding the data nuances or the data set nuances, things like understanding file naming convention and the metadata references that we often use within our NASA circles, things like short, uh, short names and concept IDs. These are all kind of abstracted uh, at the appears level. So you don't really need to know anything about this. You don't need to know anything about whether this is a tiled product or a gridded product. Is it a scene? Is it projected? What's that projection? All of that stuff is taken care of by appears as well as the date time. So is it a Julian date? Is it a day of year? What is it exactly? So this just makes working with the data uh, and accessing it a, a lot easier for, for users who use appears. From a workflow standpoint, like a scientific workflow, um, this takes a lot of that, that pre-processing steps out of the way for you. So you can really kind of get to your science faster. Um, search and discovery is taken care of. You basically just give a pair peers your, your where, what, and when, uh, and a peers goes out and grabs that data for you. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, different types of formats uh, and working with those. Uh, all you need to do is uh, work with the, the appears work for formats, which are, like I said, GIS friendly. Appears provides exploratory data analysis, uh, visualization. So before you even download uh, a byte, you can do kind of a quick uh, uh, interrogation of that data, get an intuition about it, uh, and determine whether you even want to download that data or not. Appears does the pre-processing, so things like mosaicing, uh, clipping to your area of interest, reprojections, that's all done by appears. And then also, if there is quality associated with any variable that you access through appears, it is returned by default. And those quality um, are decoded. The data values are decoded so that you know upfront kind of what each of those quality values represent. So what can appears do? This is kind of a, a flow chart of the, the, the forms that you would fill out in appears. You kind of have two pipelines here, uh, a point sample pipeline and an area pipeline. Both of the forms are very similar. Uh, one takes points, of course, the other one takes things like shape files or geojson, but essentially it's working with polygons. So on the point side, you would just add your lat long, uh, but you have some additional categories that you can add to um, the input, things like maybe a site ID or a, a land cover classification that you want associated with those points. Um, and that will be carried on uh, from your input here to the outputs that get um, uh, saved off uh, and staged. Uh, and they're also available through um, one of the visualizations and ex exploration uh, tab. On the polygon side, you can add a shape file or geojson, both of which can have multiple features associated with them. Uh, and then appears will go out and extract uh, per feature. Um, and then both have uh, the ability to draw on the map. So in the points, you can select a bunch of points and put those or put those into the map. Uh, and then on the area side, you can draw a single feature, uh, which is kind of a limitation of the area side. But when you draw on the map, you can add only a single feature per request. But if you're using a shape file or GeoJSON, uh, those, those specific files can have much more uh, features in them. From a date uh, standpoint, you have a couple options here. You can select a full date range, a, a day, month, year, start, end date, um, or you can select like a reoccurring date range. So you can add, say, the summer months, um, May, uh, June, July, August, and I want that for only three years. Uh, you know, so um, I can extract just those months and not have to extract the entire year uh, for, for those specific uh, net data requests. Um, the variable level subsetting is really kind of a, a superpower of, of appears, I'd say. Um, you don't have to download or work with um, files that have, say, sub data sets or multi variables associated with them. Um, this is operating at a variable level, so you can access individual pieces within those, those files. So if I want something from a vegetation indices product that has EDI, NDVI, 
uh, and other data sets, I can just select, say, the NDVI layer, and then I can also go to other DACs or other, other provider collections available in a peers uh, and mix and match my variables. And so um, there's a lot of power in uh, being able to subset those, those variables out and mix and match the, the variables across the multiple DACs and products. At that point, areas is done. You can submit a, a request and then appears will go out and extract uh, the data for those variables, for those time uh, steps, uh, for those individual points and return those as a CSV file. Uh, for area, you have a couple more options. Uh, you can select a file format. Uh, we provide uh, an output of a GeoTIFF or a cloud optimized GeoTIFF, uh, as well as a net CDF with CF convention for most of the data products available in appears, um, there are a couple um, caveats. Uh, EMIT actually has a, a NV option, so you can the data sets that you get from uh, requesting EMIT data um, can actually be returned in, in, in an NV format. Uh, and then after that, you submit and you can then go and explore and, and work with those data. Ultimately, appears is just kind of a, a data reduction machine. This is uh, a plot from our monthly uh, metrics. And what, what I really kind of want to draw your eye to is that those top two lines um, appears is accessing terabytes of data. Um, and it, it's accessing the source data in the archive, but it only returns to the user a fraction of that data. Uh, and that fraction actually equates to about over 95% data reduction. Uh, and so where traditionally uh, years back, you would be accessing data at the source and pulling those files and doing the processing. Appears is doing all of that. It's subsetting, it's returning that to you. And you don't even have to download the data. If you use the exploratory data analysis and decide not to do it, then, um, then there, you are not out of any time there. So huge data reduction uh, going on with the peers. What data is now available from a peers? Of course, we have NASA data sets from the, uh, the DAX. Um, from the USGS, uh, we've recently added the uh, Landsat Analysis Ready Data Collection, which is Landsat 4 through Landsat 9 uh, for North America, or sorry, CONUS, uh, Alaska, and Hawaii. And so those, those data are now available in a peers. We also have a partner uh, out at the National Park Service who's um, provided or made available a water balance collection uh, to us. And so we've been accessing that and that has variables like ET, uh, water deficit, rain, soil, uh, water um, runoff. Uh, it's very uh, interesting data set based off uh, grid, met, grid met, uh, meteorological data. And then our partner DAX, we have uh, population data, population count, density, and demographics from CDAC. We have DAMIT, temperature and precip data from ORNL. Uh, and then our earliest collaborator, NSIDC, provides us access to the MODIS snow, uh, as well as SMAP soil moisture data. These are some of the variables that you'll find in appears. This is not all, but it, it's kind of the more, I'd say, popular uh, variables that you would find. Several of these you'll actually find multiple resolution, spatial resolutions or temporal resolutions, things like reflectance and radiance come from multiple sensors, MODIS and, and BEERS and, and Landsat, and they come at multiple uh, spatial resolutions uh, that way. Um, ET, uh, evaporative stress, Water use efficiency, land surface temperature all come from the EMIT mission or the eco stress mission. Um, our population counts, of course, come from from CDAC, soil moisture, snow cover, freeze thaw, both all come from uh, NSIDC. We have our, our day met temperature and precipitation data from from ORNL. So, uh, and really all the rest uh, are are coming from the LP DAC spectroscopy data from the EMIT mission uh, is uh, the newest addition really for from our missions. Uh, and it's a very unique and interesting uh, data set uh, and really kind of a, a problem to solve with with the peers, but uh, we've done, a, I think, a pretty good job of getting it integrated. So now I'm going to uh, take a break from the presentation uh, and jump into some some demos. And first, I want to touch on 
a walk through of the interface. So if you're unfamiliar with with appears right now, hopefully you'll you'll walk away from that with a better understanding of of what appears has to offer. Uh, and then we'll kind of do a little uh, in, uh, look at the the appears API specifically through a Jupyter notebook uh, running in AWS, where we can uh, basically submit a request um, in the cloud. Uh, which is not necessary, but it is something that you can do. And then we were going to access those assets um, in the cloud as well. So a couple of examples uh, to show here. So I'll switch over. All right, so I, I think the um, the link to appears will be showing up in the chat uh, soon if it hasn't already. This is the landing page for appears. Um, as with really anything NASA Earth data, it requires an Earth Data login, uh, and so appears is really is not an exception. So you need to sign in using your Earth Data login credentials, and you'll be uh, once you're logged in, you'll have a screen like this. It'll be a little bit different than mine in that I have an admin uh, dropdown, but everything else will be the same. Um, you'll have this Extract, Explore, and Help tab, and then also this Feedback. Uh, we love feedback, but so feel free to send us whatever, um, good, bad, or other, you can send us uh, whatever you need to uh, in that feedback option. I'm gonna start in, start in this help uh, dropdown. Um, the help dropdown really just kind of gets you started. And so we have this eight appears documentation, which is a step-by-step -step guide on submitting a, a point and area sample. Um, and this will just walk you through beginning to end and further into the investigation part uh, from the appears interface. We have API documentation. So this will we'll touch on this in a little bit, but this is basically all the services that uh, appears provides via their, the API are described in, in uh, examples are, are kind of presented here. We have a recent addition of this change log. Um, most probably don't care, but it is actually a, a very useful tool to see what was uh, released uh, in a, a version. We do have frequent uh, releases of version and appears. Uh, so you can look at this change log, change log to see uh, if there are any new data sets of it or that were released, what bugs were uh, kind of uh, fixed, what features were added. And so this is a good place just to kind of keep tabs uh, on, um, on appears and uh, if you notice maybe something different from a previous request that you've ran, this is a good place to start. Um, even if you um, write uh, into us to tell us if there's a problem or if there's something that's uh, kind of changed that you want to communicate to us, um, this is this is something to look at. Available products is a pretty critical. This is just a list of the uh, missions or the, the the collections that are available two appears, uh, and so this will show um, the, the individual collections and then also the variables uh, that whether they're available or not. So you, you may see that there are some uh, very uh, collections that have available variables, but they may not have all of them available. And so uh, you can visit this um, products page just to or the available products page to, to see if the data that you're interested in is available there. Uh, and then there's this contact us. This takes you to the LPDAC contact us. So feel free to reach out again. Um, we love feedback, good, bad, or other. Uh, and so feel free, don't be shy to, to write us. Jumping over to the extract, we're gonna take a look at a point sample. Uh, really the flow is, is the same. Uh, you get into the form, you fill out the form, and then you're able to go and explore the, the results. And so, um, the first step is kind of so, or getting into the form, and there's three ways of doing that. You can either start from a, a brand new form, empty, and you populate that um, and, and submit that form. If you have a history with the peers, you can copy a previous request and, and bring that into your uh, form. So this is a previous request that had a series of points. Um, I use the um, additional option of adding a site and a, a land cover with my points here. And this is exactly what I've run previously. So it's a very quick way to uh, turn out successive requests uh, with small modifications maybe. Um, so if I wanted a different product, I can add a different product here. I can change my tank time here. 
Um, but it's a quick way to, to replicate uh, a previous request that you've run. I mentioned the, uh, the way of replicating, uh, especially across uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> supplying a, a file to a colleague to, to replicate your results. Um, that comes in this JSON file that's returned for every single uh, request. Uh, so we'll we'll see that JSON file in a little bit, but essentially you can uh, save off that JSON file, send that to a colleague. They can bring that into their peers using this option and get the same exact results that you did. And so this is all of the the point samples that was that you submitted earlier. This is the same area. This is the same data sets. And so you can make some changes or just replicate a um, a workflow that way. Um, taking a step back, I'm going to go into this one. So all requests have to start with a name. They don't need to be unique, but to, to keep them clear, I guess you you can keep them unique. Um, there are multiple ways of of adding uh, points to this. You can either select and add a CSV file, and this can have this must have a latitude and longitude comma separated. Uh, and then optionally, you can add those categories or an ID. Um, you can add it manually into this document or this um, this uh, box if you want. If you you know your lat longs, you can add those manually. You can also use this map to add points as well. And so if that's something that you just want to do, rip off a couple requests using those points, you can do that as well. Again, we have the date functionality, so it's just a simple calendar that you select from. Um, and you might, your start date has to be before your end date, of course. And then finally, the, the layer selection. So um, essentially, you, you can, this is not powered by AI. It's not machine, there's no machine learning here. This is just straight text uh, reading on the back end. So you can do some simple, uh, say, I'm interested in NDVI. Uh, I can start to in any, in type that, and anything that kind of hits on the, the that text will show up. Uh, same thing with, um, ET or, or temperature or uh, individual product name. So if I start typing in Daymet, that will start to come up and that will be available for me. So I can select that. Um, I can send them over to this uh, selected layers list and I can get information about those variables by clicking this I. Uh, and so really kind of just quick ways of, of adding data. I can remove it. Um, I can add. Um, data from different decks, what have you. And so um, really, again, this is operating at a, a, a variable level. So now I'm getting uh, ET, uh, EVI or yeah, EVI data for uh, two specific set beer sensor from NOAA 20 and then from uh, uh, Suwami NPP. And so once I'm satisfied with that, that form, I can submit that. And this green box will pop up if it's successful. It will be a red one. Um, if there's anything um, incorrect with how you filled out the form, um, you might also run into issues of a job being too big, uh, in which case you'll want to either um, reduce one of the, the, the inputs, whether it's uh, fewer polygons or fewer points, whether it's a shorter time range or uh, fewer variables, um, you just have to kind of um, mess around, I guess, uh, is the best way of saying it, with that request to get it through. After you've submitted that, you can now, you now have the ability to go and kind of um, see the status of that request. It's queued here. Um, but then once it is complete, you can go in and, and take a look at that data and explore it, which is what we'll do with this specific request. So from a point sample, uh, you have three kind of views of the data. You have this temporal comparison uh, tab, you have a layer comparison tab, and a categorical view uh, overview of the, the data. Um, and this is just giving you a, the plot of, of the data in time. And so here you can select the, the different sites uh, that were input. Uh, you can do a little bit of a filter on, on good quality. Um, depending on whether that, that specific quality um, is available for a layer. 
Uh, this is not carried through in your downloads. This is only from the UI. So you can see I mean, what that description is of good quality. Um, and so for, for Modus and Beers, there's a, a specific quality that you can key in on that says it, it's good or it's bad or it needs check uh, checking. And so that's what we, we typically key on on in the peers. Um, you can select the individual layers here. So here I got EBI selected. I can switch to GPP if I need to. Um, and then down below are the actual plots. And so you can see that they're interactive. I can hover over a point and get the date to get the, the data uh, value for that individual point, whether it's good or bad quality. You can kind of see that this is a uh, recurring uh, observation or return. So this isn't a, a straight um, date range. This is a recurring one. I can add lines to the, the plot so I can just I mean, make it make out the plot a little bit better. I can do zoom in if I need to, uh, to for a specific year, and I can move that to different years if I need to. So there's some stuff that you can uh, some interactivity with these graphs if if that's uh, something that you need to to use. Uh, below this time series is a stacked time series plot. Uh, the intent here being is, I mean, year over year, are there any kind of uh, anomalies that you um, need to key in on. And so uh, this just kind of shows those uh, years on top of each other. You can turn on, highlight, turn them off if you need to, uh, and just kind of play around again. Interactive, you can hover over the points here again uh, to get the data values. Uh, and then below, we have uh, just a simple data table if that's something uh, you want to, to dig into there. Layer comparison is a, a lot of the same stuff, just we're overlapping variables on top of each other. You have the, um, the site location again that you can choose from. Uh, you have the quality filtering that you can apply. Uh, but now I can sm or see the time series of two variables at one time. And they, uh, uh, for the, the time series, we just plot them on top of each other. Again, you can add lines and interact with the data. Uh, you can turn one, or one on or off. Um, that's what you need to do. Uh, but then below we have the kind of um, scatter plot showing the correlation of those data. Um, just really ultimately designed to get an intuition about your, your data um, at a pretty high level. And so these aren't publication quality. Uh, we're not aiming for publication quality. Um, just really want to give you the, uh, some insights in before having to download any of the data. Uh, again, we have uh, the table below on this one as well. The categorical view or overview is more of an aggregated view of your data. So this is where um, some of the, the the optional input for the site and the categories uh, comes in. Um, everything, if there's a quality association, will have this breakdown. So um, everything will be aggregated by quality. And so in this case, we can look at what quality means. In this case, what does zero one two mean? Uh, and you can get that from here, BI produce good quality. So this really, this zero is the best quality data that you can get, uh, get for this specific variable. Uh, we see that of the, the four, uh, we have three that we, we are, are working with uh, for our data that we extracted. Um, these are interactive too. These are actually connected plots uh, as well. So I can select this specific uh, box and whisker plot and it will filter down uh, across the other two uh, variables, one being category, the, the land cover that we submitted with our points, and then the other one for sites, which is just the site, unique site name. Um, I can select here as well, and this will just grab all of the deciduous broadleaf um, sites um, available. And so I can just see really kind of the, the central tendency and the spread of the data um, from here to, to make any kind of further determinations about the data. Once maybe you're, you're satisfied with what you have and, and you're wanting to kind of move to the next step, you can go to our download screen. So one way to get there uh, from the Explore tab it, or from, from this Explorer space is through this download um, drop down, or you can actually from the Explore tab up above, you have these options here. You can go to the visualization or you can go straight to the download. So you can bypass the visualization altogether if you want. Going into the download. So 
if you want to just do a download and, and get moving, you can do uh, uh, this download zip. This packages up everything and then um, and gives it to you in a in a download package. Um, but individually, we have a number of supporting files that you can leverage. Uh, the metadata files are actually uh, ISO 19115 compliant. Uh, they give you an idea about where the data came from, what the data went through in appears, um, and, and kind of who to contact uh, to, to uh, uh, contact information within that file too. So gives you some some information about what that data went through. Uh, we have a granule list. This is just a list of source URLs to the data that appears touched or data you or the data used. And so um, you can download these and do maybe a fact check, or you can maybe expand your your area of interest if you you want to just um, use the source files. Um, those are available to you. Uh, the README file contains just some information about. Uh, appears processing contains information about um, the, the data sets that are available in appears, or at least the collections, things like uh, projections being used, uh, any kind of caveats to, to be aware of when we're or accessing or working with those data out of appears. Um, so uh, some information can be gained from there. Uh, user or uh, uh, connections to the product pages and user guides uh, are available in there as well. Uh, and then finally, this JSON file. So this is a a JSON formatted file, it's used to uh, populate requests. Um, so if you download this and they hand this off to a colleague, they can take this and then upload it into appears and have the same exact request. Um, it's also something that you can use uh, to help you uh, really get better at uh, working with the API as well. Uh, so um, very, it, it's a very useful tool, at least for uh, reproducibility. And then finally, we have our, our output CSV files. These are produced. Uh, on a, a collection basis or a product basis. So if I have um, EDI, NDBI from this mod 13, both those variables will be included. Um, and then uh, the mod 17 will be its own, own file and data extracted. So um, pretty straightforward uh, CSV files um, when, when using those and, and pretty easy to work with. So um, I think I'll, I'll cut off there and and maybe jump into the API side of things. Um, getting over to the, the API documentation. So um, this is really kind of uh, one of the, the first starting points uh, that you, you might want to go to um, with the, the appears API. This, get, this is really kind of a deep dive into um, uh, the, the, the services that are available through uh, the API. Um, we have examples in both cur or in curl, Python, and, and R. And so, depending on what you're using, we have examples of um, executing a command and and the expected response out of those. Um, several services that um, you can leverage uh, and that you would would leverage, but essentially, the the API is is appears, and so everything you can do from the appears interface, except for the visualizations themselves, um, the extraction capability. Are, are the same between the API and the user interface. Um, in addition to this uh, API documentation, we have a number of uh, resources that you can leverage. So we have a repository or a GitHub repository that has uh, appears data resources. There should be a, a link in the chat um, coming, if not already there, uh, that you can either download or you can clone and work with. We provide examples in Python and R in this case. So using notebook format or using Jupyter Notebooks and R uh, Markdown to, to demonstrate using those, uh, the API in those languages. In the table of contents below, um, we have a number of resources. The Appears API area and it appears API point for both Python and R are, are really end to end demonstrations of most, if not all of the services that are available in, in a, the, the API. Uh, so it's very, there's a lot of information there, uh, but you, you'll get the ins and outs of using the API from a Python and R environment. What I'm going to highlight today is the, the access of uh, the data from the, the the cloud location where the data is stored, and so 
this is a little bit more stripped down streamlined. Um, and, and so we're going to take a look at that from this um, Jupyter notebook that I'm running in. In the cloud, um, so again, I want to reiterate that to use the API, you do not have to run in the cloud. You don't have to, to execute the API in the cloud. Um, but if you want to do a full end to end cloud workflow where you are um, not only submitting requests via the API in the cloud, but you want to access those data in S3 that are staged by appears, you need to be running in AWS US West 2, just like you would do with any other data asset that are, that are, that are contained in Earth Data Cloud. So these notebooks follow the same kind of uh, format that really all of our resources have um, across multiple DACs and specifically at the LP DAC. Um, we have a summary, we have learning objectives and an outline of um, what's going to go on or take place in this specific notebook. Um, to work with these data, we got a rather large list of packages we need to import. Let that run quick. Um, this, this resource um, was kind of developed uh, before the um, the the Earth Access package was um, made popular, uh, and so there's a couple of kind of overlapping functions that we we have in this uh, repository that we use that may be someday replaced by Earth Access. But for right now, uh, just a, maybe a heads up for anybody who's who's questioning that. That's just kind of the the state we're in right now, uh, and so this is just a way to validate. A NetRC file and a NetRC file is something that contains our Earth Data login credentials. It's something that you have to to, to uh, create and store in your local um, uh, your local uh, directory, uh, and it's used then to authenticate it with uh, Earth Data. So we're going to validate that we have a NetRC file in this case. We're going to specify the API so that we can now start calling services against that API. Um, one of the main things that you need to remember is that um, you need to authenticate, and that authentication needs to be passed down through every or passed in every service. And so that hasn't always been the case. It is now, though. So um, this is a critical step where we authenticate. Uh, the response uh, returns a token, uh, and we need to save off that token as a variable. And and we actually put it in this head object or this yeah the head Python object to be passed in our, our, our all requests um, going forward. And so this is just mandatory. You, you need to, to submit that. This looks fairly familiar <laughs> compared to the, the form. So here we're, we're just specifying those individual parameters that we specify in the form. We give it a, a task name. We specify that we want an area request. Since we're working with an area request, we can specify a projection or CRS and our output format. Um, and then we specify our date range and our, uh, and then we can read in a GeoJSON file. This one specifically to, is of the boundary of a Dixie fire in, in California. Um, and so we're going to read that in and convert that so that we can grab the, the coordinates, uh, and, and use that as our boundary in, in the appears request. And then we're just going to do a simple request for, for EDI from a, a, a product called mod 13, a one. So that's just kind of defining them in variables, and then we're going to insert those variables in this kind of very specifically structured task object. And so this is exactly what appears is expecting. Uh, and so you just basically take this, copy and paste it, and then you substitute all of these specific uh, or these specific variables, and you should be off and running with a, a appears request. So now we have this task object. We need now to, to submit that. So we're going to use, of course, the API and this specifically this task service. We're going to use that specific endpoint to pass along our task object up here, the payload. And then we're going to pass again our, our authentication using this header. So we're going to submit that. And this will, this will give us in response a task ID that's unique to this specific uh, request that we submitted and the status. One thing to note is that appears 
is is not synchronous. So I'm not going to submit a, a request and get a data result back uh, as a result. Um, it's we submit a request or we post this information for our peers to take and run through its process. And then later on, um, we can a job is done. We can um, make requests for the the assets that were created from a uh, from the bucket. And so we use this task ID throughout the process now to get a, an idea about the status to access the, the the files that are associated with this specific task once it's done. Uh, and so what we want to do is save off this task ID, and that's what we do in this next line. Um, I'm, not going to run this line because th this is a a loop that will check to see if this job gets done uh, or when it's done so that I can move on to the next cell. And so this will just say, hey, is status done? If not, and then it'll wait a minute and make another request. So it continually does that. Uh, but to avoid getting caught in a potential job that runs longer than the, the webinar here, I'm just going to use a previously run um, task. Which brings me to another point where um, if you have your login information and you have run a task or a, a job in appears, be it in the API or in the user interface, everything creates a task ID that's accessible to you. You can grab that task ID and put it here and run the rest of this notebook um, without really any modification. So this is a task ID for a previously run request. To get information or get the, the files that are associated with that specific task ID, I use this bundle service along with that task ID. And now I can get an idea, at least a single file here, of, of what we're dealing with. So this is um, the, the file that was produced. Um, and then there's some other information that you use to either download um, or using this S3 URL, we can access that data directly in S3. And that's what we're gonna do in the next steps. We're gonna identify all of the S3 URLs that have a TIFF extension. So remember I said that not only do we return variables, but we return quality associations along with that. So um, that's a good reminder that you have quality uh, returned. And so we're gonna split those up and we're just going to deal with the EDI URLs now. This is the part where we need to let AWS know that we are valid uh, users. And so we need to get some S3 credentials. These are temporary S3 credentials. They only last uh, about an hour. Uh, and so we need to get those credentials. We're going to pass them to this thing called the refreshable token. And this is kind of unique to this notebook. Um, and it will just, if you have a longer running process, will refresh those tokens uh, if you extend past that hour time. So um, we're gonna set up that. And then we're gonna pass some more configuration. Sorry for all the, the configuration talk here, but this is kind of required to let AWS know that we are valid users. And then also these GDAL configurations are used to, to just really read COG files or cloud optimized GeoTIF files in general. So. Um, we do that, and so now we should be off and running. We can access those S3 URLs uh, and bring them into to our Python environment. We will grab one of those URLs, the first one, and open it using this Rio X Array Open RAS Stereo uh, function. And so now we have this X Array object that is um, got these uh, the shape X Y here. I can load these data in if I want to start working with it. And this is really, this is no longer API. This is no longer appears API. This is now working with the data in Python. And so I can plot these data and take a, take a look at it. Now we're, we're flying through this. <laughs> so um, now we can take a look at the time series. And this is just, this isn't intended to, to, to walk through with me. Um, this is just showing some of the capabilities that we have in this specific notebook when it comes to accessing the data um, in the cloud. And so here we now we have a time series or a data cube of uh, that has a time um, variable or coordinate of 47. And then finally, we can do some, some fancier plotting of um, being able to sort through 
the individual times and make it even fancier and plot the time series for a single pixel and combine those to show, and I don't know why it's so small now, as it's earlier. Uh, but essentially, you can hover over individual spots and it will give you the time series on the right side uh, through time. So again, not really intended for um, for you to, to follow along step by step. I wanted to show you the concept where that resource was um, and, and highlight that now you can access those uh, those data assets uh, in the cloud if, if that's uh, something that uh, is desirable to you. So I will stop with the demos and I think I have a little bit more time to just go over a few few use cases real quick. Um, this isn't really a use case. This is more of a public service announcement. Um, Appear recently added uh, EMIT data. EMIT stands for Earth Surface Mineral Dust Source Investigation. It's a, a newer mission that the LPDAC supports. It has uh, spectroscopy data, 285 spectral bands uh, associated with each uh, of the tiles. And so um, we have in appears the calibrated radiance and the, the surface reflectance data uh, that you can now access. Um, you can subset the layers if you want, if you're interested in creating a, a vegetation indices from the, the surface reflectance, uh, have at it. Uh, if you want all 285 bands to create spectra, you, you can do that as well. And so here's an example of Submitting some points um, to the, the system, uh, really kind of uh, arbitrary point locations here um, where we, for these, these 50 points, uh, we request the, the surface reflectance bands from EMIT, all 285. We get this uh, Excel sheet um, returned to us where you can plot the spectra. Uh, and then uh, kind of to drive the, 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 the moral of the story home, um, EMIT data volumes are, are relatively large. The files uh, themselves range from, from two to four gigabytes in size. If you were dealing with this specific request uh, at a source file um, perspective, you, you would be dealing with 27 plus gigabytes of, of files. Um, in the case of appears, the output is two or 12 uh, megabytes. And so this is well over a, a 99% um, reduction uh, in the data. And this is really kind of the story across all these examples where um, you submit points, you submit areas, you get a massive reduction in the data um, and, and you're off and running really. So this is just an example of submitting about 200 points. Um, appears ends up touching um, 7,500 files uh, it extracts the data values, it decodes the quality for you, uh, and it takes about as much time as it takes for you to make a cup of coffee. Um, so the, 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 the timing is a little variable. Uh, it, it often depends on the load that appears sees, uh, and the load is, is often pretty great now. And so um, there may be times when you submit a job like this and it takes um, a half hour. It may take several hours uh, in, in in times when we have high loads. So just be conscious of that. It's you will not see the same um, timing uh, uh, job after job. Just some some simple plots from the the um, interface. Um, this one I wanted to highlight: extracting uh, data that requires a transformation. So both emit and eco stress data require some sort of transformation in order to get them into um, a grid, basically. So um, EcoStress comes as a swap data product. What's interesting about EcoStress is that um, I can request land surface temperature and get that data extracted, but uh, in order to georeference it, you need to request a, a, a secondary kind of uh, uh, collection that has the geolocation arrays. And so that really blows up the data volumes which you'll see in this next slide. And so appears is actually going out, grabbing the land surface temperature data product. It's grabbing the geolocation uh, data product. It's doing the transformation, converting it to a geographic grid and returning it to the user and clipping it to that, that specific boundary that we have selected here. So we have just a small um, couple of fields in Southern California where we want to get the land surface temperature from EMIT. Uh, we got some HLS bands here that we want to create a, a derived MDD, MDDI. And so with, um, with that kind of selected and appeared, we get the results on the right. 
Um, and so uh, with the peers, we're dealing with about the same number of files, right? 1,254 uh, files compared to the 1,600. Um, but the data volumes is is orders of magnitude less from the peers. And so 603 gigabytes is, is a lot to deal with. Um, so um, I think, oh, we got one more uh, snow zone. So this is just an example. Um, driving home the fact that you, you get these variables um, as time series. There's some transformation going on specifically here. Uh, the DEM from the SRTM collection is in geographic. It's being transformed into this uh, sinusoidal projection along with our land surface temperature uh, and snow data from NSIDC. Uh, and so again, just a massive reduction in the data compared to uh, working with uh, the source files. Um, in inserting a, a relatively large uh, shape file in this case. So, and that's where I will cut off. Um, I want to thank you again. Uh, feel free again to reach out to us here. You can uh, reach out to the LP DAC. Uh, you can use the Earth Data Forum to ask questions, and we are fairly responsive on on that. Uh, and then also, if you want to stay kind of up to date on on new. Or, or just news features uh, from the LP DAC, you can uh, uh, send a, or subscribe to our listserv. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Thanks yep. so much, Aaron. All right, we're going to uh, jump straight into the questions here. So I'm going to start with uh, some questions that were posed in the chat. I will try to only cover those that were not answered by one of the Q&A panelists, and then we'll hop directly over to the um, Question and answer question, excuse me, an answer panel. All right, so let's see here. If you give bear with me just for a minute. There's a bit more scrolling when we're dealing with questions in this chat. Okay. Um. Okay, so I think. Most, if not all of the questions in the chat were actually answered. So, except for this 1, so 1 of the comments was, if you could kindly increase the memory limit, we face problems while downloading time series data sets for a bit larger spatial coverage. So, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, it is a. A known limitation um, for sure, and so it is. With the, the transition to the cloud, um, we are gradually figuring out what we can and can't do. And so th this is something that is on our radar. We know that it does plague some of our users. So um, I don't wanna promise anything uh, here, but do know that we are aware of it and have been looking into it. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. And uh, so our next question, I'm going to hop over to the Q and A. And just a quick note, we really appreciate your feedback on the optional final polls. It, it really helps to identify, you know, data user needs, and also helps to identify future webinar topics. So thank you in advance for that feedback. Really appreciate it. Uh, yes. I can put the link to the presentation in the chat again in just a moment here. Let's um, read off the first question. And while Aaron is answering, I will um, place that in the. Um, I'll place that in the uh, chat in just a second. So could you pre could you provide information regarding the data set file sizes inputted? So actually, there are several questions with this one comment. Um, I'm happy to break it up. If that's helpful, could you pro provide information regarding the data set file sizes inputted into a peers by the DAC? Part 1, what is the maximum acceptable size for data set files to be inputted into a peers by the DAC? Why don't we cover that bit first mm -hmm. and then I'll follow on with the 2 last pieces of the uh, comment. Um, so far, we haven't ran into anything that. Um, is too big. Uh, EMIT is probably EMIT or, or even uh, DAMET is, is pretty large too. Um, right now, appears acts on the data where it's at. So it's if it's in Earth Data Cloud, we are we're acting on that data there. Um, if it's on prem at our our, our at our DAC, we're 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 not moving data 
um, to to some optimized space or into some optimized format to, to work with it. We're we're working with it as is basically. Um, the our external partners with uh, um, the um, uh, shoot the the water balance data. They they made their data available in S three. Those are those are pretty large too. Um, and so I I don't think I could give you a, a max size uh, necessarily. It, it it'll be if it, if there's data, and it comes to a point where um, we are trying to access it, it would be a little bit of trial and error. I think um, before we would be able to determine if something was too big. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Um, if everybody could please enter their. Um... Their questions into the Q and a panel that would be super helpful, but we've got a couple of questions. I will uh, jump back to the chat really quick and then continue following up. Actually, let's finish up this question 1st. Um, my apologies. So, let's see the 3rd part was, is there a prescribed format for the data set to be input? And lastly, what level of effort effort and time would be required to handle those large data sets? Um, format wise. I think just in general, um, my recommendation, I think our DAC recommendation would be um, cloud optimized geotiffs or or net CDF files. Um, we the the data that we deal with right now um, partially is uh, plagued might be a strong word, but I mean it is is legacy formats things like HDF four or HDF EOS two. Um, and, and so we, we've had to deal with that uh, through various mechanisms, but we found that um, we've been able to uh, make fast process, progress on formats that are in cloud optimized geotiffs, given kind of the, the, the support um, that the uh, Python ecosystem provides for those data right now. And then NetCDF has always been, has a strong, um, a strong support across multiple libraries, multiple um, scripting languages. Uh, so that's always, a, a, I think, a, a good one. NetCDF 4 specifically to, to, to work with. So um, what was the, the second part of that one? Uh, the second part of that question was, what level of effort and time would be required to handle those large data sets? Um, it's not, I don't know if, so may, maybe what I, I, I'll answer this how I think you're, you're trying to ask. So from, from a, a data integration into a peer standpoint, um, it goes through a, several checks checkpoints. Um, first, we need kind of backing from whoever is, is recommending. We do some uh, data validation checks to, to see if it would uh, fit with the current model of a peers, the, the current way we, we, we move data through the system. Um, if we're good there, then we got to get some buy-in from our, our, our government customer and do some prioritization. We do have a rather large backlog of data sets that we're trying to burn off. Um, but we just kind of, there, there's stuff that, um, if there's high demand from the, the public, that could, could justify uh, having a, a data product uh, leapfrog. Um, if that data set doesn't fit, and I, I, it could not fit for for various reasons uh, with the peers uh, right now. Um, then we would see kind of what it potentially could take if it if it is uh, actually reasonable to be able to get it in, and then kind of make some determinations there about what the level of effort would be to 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 include that, and then kind of add that to our decision making as to whether that would be a kind of a viable data set to get in in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where I'll kind of leave it there. Okay, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, all right, so just a couple more questions in the chat that we're going to hop down to the uh, Q and a. So, yes, I will share the recording um, and I will uh, send an email to all registrants. Um, it'll also be available on our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel. Uh, the next question is, what is the, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> My apologies. What is the latency from observation to availability on a peers for Landsat or Veers? Um, as soon as, oh goodness. 
So when the data is available in the archive, there is no less than a day, probably um, latency. It's probably faster than that. Um, it really kind of depends on the latency for, for the archive getting the data. Uh, and so that that's that tends to that varies greatly with with Veers right now, uh, and I am not positive with Landsat. I would have to follow up on that. So we can definitely um, follow up with you on that uh, specific question. Okay, is Sentinel two data available within a peer? Um, Sentinel two through HLS is available um, in a peer. So. HLS is a harmonized product uh, that includes both Landsat uh, 789 uh, and then, I think that's right, and then uh, Sentinel A, uh, 2 A and B. And but yes, that is that is correct. The, the 30 meter um, Sentinel, it does not have the 10 meter. Okay, great. The next question, does a peers work in collaboration with OpenScapes? Um, it does not. Short answer. Uh, we we have um, we have team members who are actively engaged in both OpenScapes and our, our uh, team members on the data services team at the LP DAC that that um, do a lot of the development and testing and appears. Uh, and so feedback and I mean crossover in resources and what have you. Um, uh, are there between the teams, but uh, appears does not have a, a direct, say, um, relationship, I guess, with with OpenScapes right now. Okay, thank you so much, Aaron. The next question is, and I am in the Q and A panel right now for the time being. If you have a question, please enter it there. That would be very helpful. All right, the next. Let me make sure I. Is appears the same as Google Earth Engine, and does appears provide cloud computational power to do some basic calculating? Uh, it is not. Um, Google Earth Engine, as, as you probably know, is is a a platform, right? It's it's a place that um, has data archived in in Google. It has a, a catalog that you can call from. Uh, it has processing routines that you can leverage. Uh, appears is is not that it is um, a a utility that you can use to uh, bring in your uh, your area of interest your your time series um, it will go out and extract or not sorry your time range it will go out and extract the data that you need for your your specific uh, uh, research needs uh, and then after that it's really kind of um, up to you what what you want to do with that data um and so we we just we stage the data and make it available to you there are no um processing routines that uh, appears has that you can run against the data in the explore exploration tab Okay, thank you, Aaron. The next question is, what is your process for onboarding new data sets? If a large collaboration collecting Earth system data wanted to work with you, how should we start that conversation? Uh, reach out first. We need to identify some points of contact. We need to become um, more familiar, I guess, with each other and the data. Um, I think that that will probably be the 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 most important parts. Uh, there's a lot, again, that, that kind of goes in to making a determination um, about whether a data set gets included into a peers. Um, there's a, a, of course, capacity um, discussions as well. We can only, a, as a, a team, as we are right now, can only include so many data sets uh, within the, the, the time allotted. Um, and so, we would have to um, become more familiar with the data, become more familiar about um, its uh, desire, its its community impact, um, and and start prioritizing uh, from there. But first step is to reach out, and we can we can have that conversation. Okay, thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> Let's see our next question. Okay, this had to do with uh, on an order of magnitude, how long would a job like the one in the API example during your demo would that take? 
the API example, uh, so um, you'll find that there'll be sometimes when a request will go through super fast. And so I'm so, when I say super fast, that, that, that Dixie example in the API um, will get done in minutes. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll, it could get done potentially in less than five minutes. Um, but there may be times when appears it has a heavy load on it um, and it will be much longer, several hours to, to run that. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of variables that play come into play there. We do have, I mean, kind of these processing lanes. And so we try to get uh, the small jobs done faster, but sometimes we just, we just have a ton of small jobs coming in. Uh, and so that, that really kind of uh, impacts um, the time it takes for a request to come or to, to happen. And so um, I don't have a, a definitive, if it's, if it's this big, um, it will get done this fast. It, it, it just, it really de depends on the load that is currently on appears uh, when you submit that request. Okay, well, thanks so much, Aaron. So our next question in the Q and A, and we have about five minutes left, left, excuse me. What does your backend engineering look like? Is all your data sitting in a database or flat files? What hap when you get an API request, what happens on the back end? Looks like you're generating a GeoTIFF file and handing that back. Is that correct? So, like I said earlier, we, we act on the data in the archive. And so uh, when a request comes in, uh, our system will uh, query the Earth Data CMR API and get an idea of what, um, what files uh, to access. Um, we'll then kind of access those files and do the the processing and clipping, uh, mosaicing of those 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 files in place, um, and then yeah we'll we'll take those um, kind of results and output them as a GeoTIFF or a NetCDF file. Okay, thanks, Aaron. There was a question about um, when SWAT data might be available in uh, appears, and my response was, I don't know if the plans are in place yet for that, um, but certainly there is SWAT data available right now um, at our NASA Fiscal Oceanography Data Center. I don't know if you have anything to add regarding specific plans. I do not have anything to add other than um, we would love to hear from somebody on that team to discuss um that option um we we want appears to be um more enterprise i mean right now we have access to multiple dac data but it is a very small subset of dac data um we want it we it's open to all and, and, and so we want to uh coordinate with the swap team to to identify those high priority uh, data sets and see uh, what can be done to to include those, whether it's it's just um, the appears the current appears team, or if there there are other ways of accomplishing getting those data into appears. Okay, thank you, Aaron. There are two more questions. I'm not sure if we'll get to both, but possibly is commercial use of appears allowed? For example, selling derived products elaborated from data extract extracted through appears. Uh, there's no restriction. For appears, whatever um, uh, the the data we're accessing is free and available. It's under uh, the NASA policies, so um, yeah, it's completely open to um, the public in in any or uh, commercial use. Okay, the final question is: Does appears include any high resolution? Less, I know the answer to this, but less than ten meter reflectance data. No, it does not. Yeah. All right, so let me take one last look. I will, I will kind of build on to that. So the, 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 the finest spatial resolution that appears has is HLS um, for the globe. Uh, and then um, the Landsat ARD is at 30 meters uh, for yes. uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Okay, I'm just taking a really quick scan. I don't see any additional questions and we're just about um, out of time for that. Uh, so what we'll do now is I will leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes. 
we'll log off from the audio component, but if you think of something, please feel free to um, enter your question or your comment into either the chat or the Q&A, and I will, uh, these logs will be forwarded to our Q&A panelists as well as to our speaker, and they can certainly follow up with you offline. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you for, we've lost uh, quite a few people so far because it's getting late, but um, I'd just like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I think our next webinar is actually going to focus on the tempo air quality um, data sets, uh, and that will be on May 29th. So in the weeks to come, we will have uh, some information on earthdata.nasa.gov. All right, so let me put the PowerPoint link in the uh, chat again, and I would like to thank all of our Q&A panelists and also thank our speaker. And with that, um, I will log off from the audio component and leave the virtual meeting space open. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, goodbye now.